I'm working on a project and I need your help. I'm looking for insights Bible readers have gained into scripture by comparing multiple English Bible translations. The lone rule is that you can't know Greek or Hebrew. You can reach me in the comments on this video or through the contact form at my website, byfaithweunderstand.com. I mentioned this request to an astute friend and diligent Bible student, a grandmother who works full-time as a writer editor, super sharp. A day later, I received this. I read a passage this morning that might fit your search for translations that clarify text for me without my knowledge of the original languages. I'm not sure if this is the type of thing you are looking for, but it is a verse I would not have understood otherwise. In Exodus 4.19, the Lord tells Moses to go to Egypt and gives directions, but in verse 24, I read that the Lord sought to kill him. So why would the Lord give an instruction followed by seeking his death? The Amplified Bible adds text in brackets that helped me. Now it happened at the lodging place that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him, bracket, making him deathly ill because he had not circumcised one of his sons. Of all the versions I went to, this was the only one that added the reason. Accurate, you think? I felt so honored that she would take time to respond to my request that I almost turned off my critical thinking skills and just wrote back, awesome. But stupid critical thinking skills, I couldn't do this. I had to probe. Something seemed a little off. I remembered that passage in Exodus well. I've puzzled over it many times. It seemed to me, and I confirmed this with a quick check of a few translations and my Lexham English Hebrew Interlinear Bible, that the text never explained why the Lord sought to kill Moses. The Amplified Bible, in other words, was adding commentary to the text. Now, there's nothing wrong with speculation and interpolation as long as it's clearly marked off, as the Amplified Bible does, and understood by the reader to be speculation and interpolation. It's the latter I'm concerned about. I fear that some readers, even a very sharp one like this grandmother, might assume that the things in brackets are sort of hidden in the Greek and Hebrew, waiting for the Amplified Bible to come along and unearth them for English readers who've been stuck with other inferior translations. I believe this is what I thought as an 18-year-old picking up the Amplified Bible for the first time. But the things the Amplified Bible interpolates into Exodus 4.19 aren't hidden in the Greek and Hebrew. They are interpretive and explanatory expansions. They are commentary. I asked my editor friend, so as an exceptionally astute reader yourself, did you feel it was clear to you where they were getting the one idea they added, the sickness, and the one they strengthened, namely the reason for the Lord's desire to kill Moses? My astute friend replied, the brackets tell me this is added thought, but I did not know where the thought originated. Uh-oh. This exchange got me thinking about the Amplified Bible. I bought this very copy of the Amplified in 1998 as a young college student. I didn't quite know what to make of the Amplified Bible. I didn't quite understand what it was trying to do. It was just weird to read in John 3.16, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that Whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal, everlasting life. It seemed to me that the Amplified was just racking up synonyms from the English thesaurus. I guess that wouldn't be so bad. The additions are, again, clearly marked off in brackets and parentheses. But it turns out that the Amplified thinks it's shooting at a higher target than just clarification and commentary. The preface explains the Bible's fulsome parenthetical interpolations. The Amplified Bible's genius lies in its rigorous attempt to go beyond the traditional word-for-word -word concept of translation to bring out the richness of the Hebrew and Greek languages. Its purpose is to reveal, together with the single English word equivalent to each key Hebrew and Greek word, any other clarifying meanings that may be concealed by the traditional translation method. Perhaps for the first time in an English version of the Bible, the full meaning of the key words in the original text is available for the reader. In a sense, the creative use of the amplification merely helps the reader comprehend what the Hebrew and Greek listener instinctively understood. This, I'm afraid, is bad. Let me tell you why. In 1998, I was a 17-year-old budding Bible student. I hadn't taken any linguistics courses, any Greek or any Hebrew, 
if I read this preface, which is a big if for a 17-year-old, I don't recall it raising any red flags. But now, after years of studying and compulsively thinking about language, particularly Greek, Hebrew, and English, and their relationship in Bible translation, I'm afraid the red flags wave madly at me when I read the Amplified Bible's explanation of itself. Every line shows linguistic misunderstandings, and my critical thinking skills won't let me say it more nicely. Traditional translation methods are not concealing meaning, except at very subtle levels, places in which, for example, the number of a relative pronoun simply can't be expressed except through context, because who and whom, relative pronouns in English, can be either singular or plural. We don't mark them for number the way Greek and Hebrew do. In particular, the key words in the original text don't have full meanings that our modern translations are somehow obscuring. The word conceal vastly overstates the limitations of traditional Bible translations, such as the English Standard Version, the New International Version, the King James, the CSB, and the New Living Translation. Linguists such as James Barr have told us that the basic unit of meaning in language is not the word anyway. It hovers somewhere between the sentence and the paragraph. In other words, just listing words doesn't give you any meaning unless they're placed in a context. Therefore, the Amplified's preface is loading up Greek and Hebrew words with more meaning than they are meant to bear. Here it is again. Take as an example the Greek word pistuo, which the vast majority of versions render believe. That simple translation, however, hardly does justice to the many meanings contained in the Greek pistuo, to adhere to, to cleave to, to trust, to have faith in, to rely on, to depend on. Consequently, the reader gains understanding through the use of amplification, as in John 11:25. Jesus said to her, I am myself the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, adheres to, trusts in, and relies on me, although he may die, yet he shall live. This really isn't right. Believes in is the correct translation. Jesus could have said adhered to, or trusts in, or relied on, and he didn't. Adhering, trusting, and relying are not ideas hidden in the Greek word pistuo, but concealed by the ESV, NASB, NIV, CSB, etc. The Greek and Hebrew words for believe aren't any richer than the English, French, Spanish, or German ones. Now, the word pistuo may be used in contexts which highlight its affinity with relying on or trusting in, but so can the English word believe. It's context which flavors a word. I'm not saying that words can mean only one thing. Words can indeed have various senses. I'm saying what respected evangelical linguist Moises Silva says, quoting another scholar, the best meaning is the least meaning. Silva recommends that Bible interpreters, here he again quotes another scholar, define a word in such fashion as to make it contribute least to the total message derivable from the passage where it is at home. In other words, if your translation of a Greek or Hebrew word radically changes the meaning of the passage from what the standard translations already say, go back and check again until it doesn't. The Amplified Bible, when used according to its stated design, invites readers to deny this interpretive truism. It makes them think, ah, now I know what the Greek word here really means, and then invites them to choose their own adventure, picking the meaning they like most among the synonyms included in brackets. This kind of thinking undermines our excellent English Bible translations. Who doesn't want a Bible that tells you what really happened to Moses in that obscure, even troubling passage in Exodus 4? And if that information is hidden in the Hebrew, why not bring it out? Because it isn't there. Our conventional translations have already told us what Exodus 4.19 says. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him, but Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. That's all. That's what it says. Every major modern English Bible translation says pretty much precisely this. The same things the King James said before them, the same thing the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint said even before Christ. Thankfully, however, the Amplified, like a fair amount of Bible teaching out there, is better in practice than in theory. 
and it's still worth a look sometimes. The fact is that this passage in Exodus 4 is obscure, and the Amplified's guess at what was going on is a good one, a very good one that is attentive to the hints within the passage. Essentially, the Amplified Bible is a study Bible with very brief notes that are brought from the margins of the page into the text. Not infrequently, the Amplified Bible uses a traditional translation of an obscure word such as firmament, but then offers a rendering that will be easier for modern readers to grasp, such as expanse. That's helpful. The interpretive glosses it adds can also be downright insightful. Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be signs and tokens of God's provident care. I don't think I ever stopped to ask myself in Genesis 1.14, signs and tokens of what? The Amplified Bible forces me to ask that question by answering it. The sun, moon, and stars are signs and tokens of God's provision for his creation. And that looks to me like a good answer. Even if that answer is in no way hidden in the Hebrew or concealed by other Bible translations, it's a genuine Bible study help. Even when the interpretive glosses are controversial, they're still worth having for certain readers. God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image. Bible readers throughout church history have argued about whether the Trinity is meant here. I don't think the question can be answered definitively until we know even as also we are known. But inserting one position into the text is helpful for readers who, like me as a young person, never stop to ask, who's the us in let us make man in our image? Once again, the Amplified Bible forces you to ask an important interpretive question by answering it. The editors of the Amplified knew that they were guessing sometimes. The gold of that land is of high quality. Delium, pearl, and onyx stone are there. They had an eye for metaphors that might need a little explanation. In this sense, the Amplified tends to combine the value of formal translations and functional translations, sometimes called literal and dynamic. The eyes of all wait for you, looking, watching, and expecting, and you give them their food in due season. It is maximally efficient for a study Bible to stick little clarifications right in the text rather than forcing readers to follow a footnote down to the bottom of the page. If you don't know who Cephas is in the New Testament, the Amplified helps you. When Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I protested. All of the examples I've just given are good things the Amplified does, despite not because of the theory of what they're doing that's stated in their preface. Somebody in your Bible study group should probably have the Amplified Bible on his or her iPad in your next Bible study, especially if there's a nerdy person around who can help others understand the nature of its notes. Just skip that preface. I suggest that you view the Amplified as an efficient study Bible, the fruit of deep dedication to the text of scripture, an interesting oddity of American evangelicalism that puts one of the movement's healthiest impulses on full display, the desire to understand scripture. You want to understand scripture, right? I'd really, really like to know, as I plan for a future book, what insights you've gotten from checking multiple English Bible translations, as I have so many times starting 20 years ago when I bought this thing for 50 bucks I don't know where I got. Please make a comment. I would so love to hear from you, and perhaps you'll make it into my next book. That and $6.99 will get you a copy of the Amplified Bible. Just promise me you'll cross out the marketing copy on the back.